bankruptcy. We say no to the bankruptcy. But a federal judge says yes to the city's Chapter 9 bankruptcy filing. This is a death sentence for 23,000 retirees. There's going to be pain for a lot of different people. Tonight, retirees are bracing for the worst after finding out their pensions are indeed at risk. And it's not fair to us who worked, who supported this city, who still lives here, and they're going to do that to us. They don't care about the people. But despite the stigma of bankruptcy, others say this will help Detroit get back on its feet. Let's come together, let's work together, and let's get this done. Bankruptcy isn't the problem. Bankruptcy is the solution to the problem. Fox 2 News. News that works for you. Starts now. A federal bankruptcy judge puts Detroit in the history books. It is now the largest city in U.S. history to be granted bankruptcy protection. Today, Judge Stephen Rose ruling that Detroit is eligible for Chapter 9 bankruptcy. He says the city owes about $18 billion to 100,000 creditors and should have filed years ago. Detroit's emergency manager is pleased with today's ruling. One of the things we need to do is to recognize first and foremost that we've been marching our way here for 60 years. That's two generations. It's going to take some time for us to dig ourselves out of this predicament and out of this situation citywide. The incoming mayor will have a better balance sheet than any mayor has had in the last 15 to 20 years. Our governor's office will file its plan of adjustment outlining how Detroit will move forward by the end of the year or by early January. It could include exploring or selling off city assets, including the water department and artwork from the DIA. Retirees could also be affected. The EM says he wants to negotiate and lessen the impact of cuts to their pensions. Retirees picketed outside the federal building before and during today's announcement. Judge Rose ruled that pensions are not protected in bankruptcy. The attorney for AFSCME filed an appeal following today's ruling. We believe that bankruptcy can be a flexible tool and that you don't have to treat retirees who are getting $19,000 a year with no safety net exactly the same as you do other creditors. This is a death sentence for 23,000 retirees if he allows the pensions to be cut. Some of them, for example, retired police officers don't have the benefit of Social Security. So therefore, their pension is what they rely upon. The bargaining process continues to go on, and we will continue to bargain uh, at, this, at this particular point. Judge Rhodes is urging emergency manager Kevin Orr to negotiate with the pensioners before the court approves any plan of adjustment. Word of Detroit's bankruptcy ruling spread quickly to Lansing. And state leaders were quick to respond. Well, I've lived there all my life, and I know the people of Detroit are very resilient. Uh, they're going to back their government, um, such as it is. Bankruptcy isn't the problem. Bankruptcy is the solution. This is really going to be about restoring the city, and that's a good thing for the people of the city of Detroit. There was no shock from state leaders. Senate Democratic leader Gretchen Whitmer believes Governor Rick Snyder has not been honest with the people and other options were available. Others are concerned about who will be hurt during this process. But many lawmakers are optimistic and believe the city will survive. Detroit's bankruptcy approval, topic number one on a special edition of Let It Rip Tonight. What happens to the role of Kevin Orr now that the bankruptcy court will make most of the decisions for the city? Our panel is here and ready to let it rip. Look for it later in the newscast right here on Fox 2. Another report of gun violence at Eastern Michigan University. Shots were fired outside an off-campus apartment building, hitting a student inside. Fox 2's Alexis Wiley spoke to this latest victim who's recovering from a gunshot wound to her shoulder. Alexis is live in Ypsilanti. Alexis, what can you tell us? Well, Monica Newell, this young woman and her roommate are still very much in shock tonight, and their parents say that this incident really proves just how dangerous the community surrounding the campus can be. I'm all right, just in pain. Destiny Liebhart should have spent Tuesday night preparing for classes, but instead she's at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital recovering from a gunshot wound. It happened while the 20 year old from Farmington Hills was asleep in her apartment here at Peninsular Place, just north of EMU's Ypsilanti campus. I heard like a popping noise, like a bang, 
popping noise. And I like took my phone and I like looked at it and I noticed that it was blood all over my hand. Destiny had been shot. The bullet came from outside her apartment building and through her bedroom wall. I didn't know if there was going to be like more shots being fired. I didn't know if somebody was intentionally shooting at me or what was going on. When I opened up my door, she was sitting on the floor outside of it and she turned and looked at me and was like, I just got shot. Destiny's roommate, Tammy, called 911. They told us, you know, to get down on our floor in the kitchen, by our stove, by our refrigerator, and to grab a towel and to um, apply the pressure. That was just hysterical, you know, because she called and she told me that someone shot in her room, and then she hung up the phone. And I didn't know what to think because I kept calling her back and I wouldn't get no answer. Destiny is the latest in a string of EMU students hit by off-campus violence. EMU football player Demarius Reed was murdered in his off-campus apartment building during a botched robbery. And Julia Nieswender was murdered more than a year earlier in the same apartment building where Destiny was shot. The university is hiring more police officers, beefing up patrols in problem areas, and working with apartment buildings to improve off-campus security. But Tam Tammy and Destiny's parents say it's still not safe and their daughters will be moving back on campus. She's not going back. Even if I have to pay double, double rent, she's not going back there. It's not worth it. I don't care if it takes all my pension. If it was me, I would have gotten it in the back of the head. And also if she was in a different position, she would have gotten in the neck or the head as well. It could have been way worse than what it was. And Stunning by like recent events with people on campus and what they went through and the losses that they had that I'm very lucky. Now Destiny is still in the hospital tonight. She could be released sometime tomorrow and she's expected to make a full recovery. Meanwhile, the university has already offered both Destiny and Tammy dorms on campus. Live in Ypsilanti, I'm Alexis Wiley, Fox 2 News. Well, Alexis, we're glad she's going to be okay. Uh, is the university seeing any kind of a spike in students who want to move back on campus because they're afraid? Well, I asked that question when I spoke with the media spokesperson. He said at this point, it's still too early to tell whether they're going to see a real increase. But again, the feeling that you get when you talk to parents, when you talk to students, is that students are afraid living off campus, and many of them want to move on campus. Monica? Yeah, climate of fear. All right, thanks for that live report, Alexis. A 25-year-old man with special needs waits in line at a gas station when he's suddenly attacked and beaten. Police are hoping that you can help them find out who did it. And Fox 2's Taryn Asher is live in Redford Township tonight with the shocking surveillance video. Taryn? Yeah, it really is disturbing. This happened around 7.30 last night. The guy who lives in the neighborhood walked into this Marathon gas station like he does every day. But this time, he was attacked randomly by a customer, and it was all caught on tape. Jermaine is a very um, nice young man. You know, he just has to be guided. Life hasn't been easy for 25-year-old Jermaine Finley. His mom, Tanisha Williams, says her son is mentally challenged. Most of his issues stem from his severe case of epilepsy, but he wouldn't hurt a fly. That's why her heart dropped when she learned he was a victim of a random gas station beating in Redford Township. Cruel, heartless um, person to even you know, consider to do anyone this way, not just my son. And what makes this even worse? Police say Jermaine did nothing to provoke it. Cameras were rolling at the marathon on Telegraph near West Chicago. You see Jermaine walk into the gas station and visit with the clerk who usually gives him a cigarette. Jermaine steps out of the way so the clerk can help the customer who pays a couple of bucks for gas. You can see they never appear to speak. The man then puts his money back in the wallet, takes one step toward the door, pivots, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, cold cock Jermaine, who falls to the ground. The white guy with the Michigan coat and red hat proceeds to kick and stomp on Jermaine while he's down. He stomped me and he hit me in my head and in my ears. Were you scared? Yes. I wonder why he did that to me. I don't know why. Jermaine claims he never said anything to the guy, and Mohammed Farakadine, who was working behind the counter at the time, said he didn't see any interaction between the two either. No, he just moved to the left a little bit. He turned around and just hit him right away in the face. Why are you? I don't know. Nobody knows. 
What else is strange about this? The guy then turns around, walks out, and then proceeds to pump his $2 worth of gas into his red van like nothing happened. Jermaine left and told his mom what happened. She immediately called police, but the guy was already gone. Detectives now hope this surveillance video will help identify the suspect who attacked an innocent and defenseless young man who has the mentality of a child. I want him caught because he did the wrong thing. I want justice, you know, as far as somebody knowing or recognizing him, finding out who did this, you know, so it can't happen again. And another big issue here is that Jermaine already suffers from this severe seizure disorder. Doctors are now concerned about the additional head trauma that he received. He's already pretty banged up. He's going to be heading back to the hospital for additional testing. Now, in the meantime, though, if anybody does recognize that man in the surveillance video who did attack Jermaine, they are asked to call Redford Township Police right away. We're live in Redford Township tonight. I'm Tara Asher, Fox 2 News. Back to you, Huel. Tara, this is disturbing to watch. It seems that Jermaine had no contact at all with his attacker inside the store before the violence. Did anything happen outside the store away from the cameras? Maybe? You know, first of all, I do want to point out they did come in at different times. We did look at that surveillance video of what we can see from the outside. No contact on the way in, no contact on the way out. But you are you have to be sure here. Police do plan to question this man what this was all about when they do get him in custody. Back to you. Right, let's hope that's very soon. Sharon, thank you. Yes. All right, Tiger said a closer was the top priority, and in fact, it appears they have their man. Reports say they have a two-year deal with Joe Nathan. The latest on that deal, plus news on a few free agent outfielders that could impact Detroit's offseason as well. See you with sports in just a bit. Keep up the good work. Even though you're in handcuffs, keep up the good work. I'm in handcuffs. Keep my family safe. He's in handcuffs and praising Detroit's new police chief. How many bad guys DPD got off the streets today while raiding one of Detroit's most criminal addresses? Another raid and more applause for the Detroit Police Department. For the second time in three weeks, Chief James Craig led officers on a raid in an area known for crime. This time it was the MLK apartment complex. 
42 people were put in handcuffs for crimes, including assault, counterfeiting, and drugs. It's been, what, 30 years since something's been done here? Do you know walking uh, through the homes here continually resonate as we walk by, thank you, thank you. One lady started praying, said this was overdue. It's not just the residents who praise the officers. One man in handcuffs also thanked the chief. Keep up the good work. Even though you're in handcuffs, keep up the good work. I'm in the handcuffs. Keep my family safe. What kinds of things go on here? A lot of drug dealing, um, a lot of selling. We didn't even hear prostitution and everything. It's rough? Yeah, King Holmes is rough. Coming up tonight on The Edge, Fox 2's Charlie LaDuff joins the officers as they raided the homes and took people into custody. The Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office hosting the second Identify the Missing event. During the previous event, 12 bodies were identified thanks to the help of family members who provided DNA. Relatives were asked to bring pictures of their missing loved ones, x-rays, medical and dental records, and at least two biological relatives. My baby brother Jeremy Jamal Crowley has been missing since August 19th, 2012. And we have yet to get any closure to his, his disappearance. It's been a long time coming. I, we, we've been looking for him. Another event is scheduled for May. The debate over abortion gets ugly at the state capitol. At issue, should health care plans cover abortion? Right now, most health plans routinely cover the cost, and emotions are running high over whether to change that. Right to Life supporters are proposing separate insurance for abortions. We don't want to pay for someone else's abortion. But if they choose to exercise that option, isn't that legal? It is legal, but I don't want to pay for it. How many women can plan for an unplanned pregnancy. And by taking away that right and requiring this additional rider is another burden on a woman's right to choose. Right to Life believes it has the votes to pass this bill by the end of the year. As you sit in a job interview and realize this job is not for you, should you tell them? I have the answer coming up in the job shop. So what do you want out of life? Out of my life? Yeah. I won't. I want my family back. Staying out of trouble and getting a hand up. It's a program megastar Eminem supports, and he's willing to match your donations dollar for dollar to see some kids succeed. How to get in on it. That's next.
Looks like a sign of optimism for the local economy. A lot of national chains are taking a look at what's going on here in southeastern Michigan, and they're opening up locations in Metro Detroit, a lot of it in the food industry. Tim Horton's calling the job shop. They're opening up a new location in Livonia, and they need everybody. Plenty of openings here. They provide benefits, including a scholarship program, and they say there are opportunities to advance. More information and a link to apply at myfoxdetroit.com in the job shop. So you get to the job interview and you realize this one is not for me. Don't give up. Give it your best. A lot of hiring managers admit that they often go through an interview and decide the person might not be good for that job, but they might be a better fit for something else they have in mind. Sometimes it's a higher level position. As long as you're there and you have their attention, do your best to impress. You never know who they know and where they think you might fit in. Everybody knows people. More tips and links to millions of openings right now at MyFoxDetroit.com. Right there in the job shop. It's working for you. Some children in the Van Dyke Public School System kick off the holiday season with some real-life heroes. Tonight, Meyer in Warren hosted a Christmas with a Firefighter event. Fifteen kids from Carlson Elementary each received a $100 gift card for some holiday shopping. And as an added bonus, they got to shop with a Warren firefighter. It was fun, and I, I liked how uh, the firefighter helped me pick out everything. This is probably one of the best events that we're involved with. Um, it's a great time to bring a lot of joy to the kids. Um, we work with the school counselor who picks these kids for us. These kids are picked on need and just citizenship. Uh, a lot of these kids are really needy, and this brings some gifts to their Christmas. Meyer has sponsored this event for the past eight years. They donated $2,500 toward the cause as well. Eminem has a challenge for Detroiters. He wants you to team up with him to help disadvantaged children. Fox 2's Jason Carr shows you how every dollar can make a big difference. In a dimly lit gym on Detroit's east side, I'm playing basketball with kids one third my age. I'm old, slow, can't jump, can't shoot. But whatever good natured trash talk I'm expecting, and really it would be deserved, never happens. The teens are polite, respectful of their elder, and focused on teamwork. Meanwhile, in a nearby classroom, other at-risk kids concentrate on computers and geometry. But it's more than academics. Following instructions, being, being polite and, and, and considerate of people, making sure everybody okay. Do you think you've grown as a person in this program? Yes, a lot. How so? Uh, I used to be disrespectful, now I'm trying to be a little more respectful to my old elders. This is Wolverine Human Services. Well, this building, which used to be a convent, is but one outpost of Wolverine, a nonprofit dedicated to helping kids find the right path. Since I've been in this program, I have improved on my behavior, my education, and communication skills. Some are here by choice, some not, but what's at stake is clear. So what do you want out of life? Out of my life? Yeah. I want, I want my family back. The basketball hoops were made possible by Eminem. Now the famous rapper is upping his game. Until midnight tonight, every dollar the public donates to Wolverine, Eminem will match it up to 100 grand. And that's money well spent. Just listen. Respecting adults, uh, following directions, not fitting into negativity, and using communication. And if you do all that? I will be going home. We have a link on MyFoxDetroit.com so you can donate. And if everyone watching right now donated just one buck, one single dollar, the goal would be reached. Jason Carr, Fox 2 News. I'm meteorologist Rick Schluterman. We've seen pockets of damp weather across the area today and still some wet weather across lower Michigan. Notice those uh, purple and blue shaded colors up around Cadillac and Alpena. That's where the snow is right now, along with that colder air. We're going to see temperatures rise overnight. In fact, tomorrow, a lot of us will be in the 50s. Get ready for a big cool down for the weekend and perhaps some light snow Sunday night. We'll check the full seven day coming up after the break.
Some of us started out today with a bit of light wet snow and then most of us did change over to get some pockets of light rain, still pockets of uh, very light drizzle across the area. Some heavier, steadier showers north of Lansing approaching Flint. But again, this trend is going to end overnight. We are concerned up around Saginaw, Mount Pleasant. Also in the Thumb area, there could be a bit of uh, 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 freezing drizzle mixing in for the next couple of hours. But that again is up in the Thumb area, not down here. 39 current reading at Metro Airport with some drizzle. The dew points are going to start creeping up and that means these numbers are also going to be moving up as the night progresses. All of these numbers above 32, so we are not concerned about icing on the roadways. The winds are variable right now, but they'll start to uh, kick out of the southeast and south, and that means tomorrow many of us get up into the 50s. Check out these warmer numbers right now. Close to 50 in Springfield and in Chicago as we speak. 30 in Traverse City, cooler there, 44 Pittsburgh, but there is a lot of wintry weather off to our north. You can see these shades of purple and blue covering northern Michigan. That's where the snow is. Also snow in Minnesota, the Dakotas. All of this, I'm glad to say, is going to stay to our north. We're going to be on the warm side of this next weather maker for the next 36 hours. That means the snow and the coldest of the air is off to our north. Here's this mild air surging across lower Michigan tomorrow. It looks like a pretty good chance for some late day rain showers as this cold front gets closer. But I'll show you with Fox Snowcast where the accumulating snow will be in the next 36 hours here in northern lower Michigan and especially up across northern Minnesota, the western UP, better than eight inches of snow way up there to our north and west. For the rest of tonight, it's cloudy. It's still cool out there. Some spotty showers ending before sunrise. 38 is the low, but again, temperatures mainly rising overnight. Tomorrow, a cloudy, milder day. Some late day or evening showers, but how about 53 degrees? That may be the warmest day for the next couple of weeks, and you'll see in the seven day forecast. It gets a whole lot colder here starting Thursday, then into Friday. And how about Saturday? 26 degrees for a daytime high. Check some of those nighttime lows in the teens, and there is a chance for some light snow Sunday night into Monday morning. We'll check the numbers coming up on the edge at 11. I'm Dan Miller coming up in sports. The Pistons down in Miami tonight and pulling off a surprise. Plus, we'll show you MSU as they get set to go in the Big Ten championship game. Stick with us. Yes, uh, we're here on Letter Rib Special Edition Historic Day. Welcome to C-Corp. How's that? Thank you. John? Yes. Mic check, please. Uh, historic Day, we're in Letter Rip. What was it again? Um, pretty good. Bankruptcy yep. edition. There we go. Uh, the Pistons won. They beat the Miami Heat, which we was... Do this. <laughs> which was...
All right, Pistons down in South Beach take it on the Heat. Let's get right to it. They saw a big lead down to three in the fourth, but shot clock winds down. Look at Brandon Jennings. Drilling a long triple six-point game. Josh Smith, known for his defense, not always. Coming up with a steal alone on the other end for the big slam lead up to nine. Seven-point game with just over two minutes to go. LeBron strips Rodney Stuckey, driving the other way to cut the lead to five. But look, Jennings swipes it from LeBron. Here we go the other way. Jennings to Monroe, who finishes. Pistons had six players in double figures. How about a road win in Miami? Beat the Heat 107-97. All right, the Tigers, Jacoby Ellsbury won't be here in Detroit. Reportedly has a deal with the Yankees. Seven years, $153 million. He could be your neighbor, Huel. New York Daily News says Detroit's top outfield target is Shinsu Chu. Now, according to reports, the team has a two-year deal with veteran Joe Nathan. He comes off a 43-save season in Texas with the Rangers. He's 39. Not a lock, but if he's right, he fills a big hole in the back end of that bullpen to the Lions. All right. For us in the media, for you, the fans, it's hard not to look at the NFC North and see the team with a lead, the tiebreakers, and a great chance to win their first division title in 20 years. That said, they have work to do, so in Allen Park, they're ignoring the big picture and concentrating on the little one. We're really not trying to look too far in the future. Um, you know, destiny is, is Sunday, you know, and, that, and that's what we have to focus on. We're in control of, of what happens in Philly. If we can look at it like that on a weekly basis, the playoffs will take care of itself. But once you start looking at the playoffs and figuring out who's going to be in what slots and what teams are playing where, you're losing focus on what's most important. And what's most important is getting ready for a really good Philadelphia team because they're playing at a high level. All right, college football Big Ten Championship game will be here on Fox 2 Saturday night. Our pregame show starts at 7. Woody Woodruff, Ryan Armani, and former Spartan Mill Coleman. Games at 8, our postgame show follows. There's so many storylines and possibilities for these two teams. Just love this, though, from Connor Cook on what it means as they move towards kickoff. This is the most important week of, you know, ever, our entire lives. You know, definitely this most important week for my life since I've been alive. You know, I mean, stuff you dream about. Um, the implications that are riding on this game. Um, so you, you, you can't come, come away from this game with you know, regrets or anything. So I'm going in this game with no regrets, um, preparing my butt off, uh, getting the film, watching the film uh, of Ohio State, and just going over a game plan. Spartan fans feel the same way. They want that Rose Bowl, and they don't want to back into it. They want to get into it with a victory, beat Ohio State, and go in there with a big record and only one loss on it. And if there's anybody that can beat Ohio State, Michigan State can't. Well, that defense, from what we've yeah. seen, and everybody says, oh, we don't know who they played. Look, we're going to find out because that's a good offense from Ohio State, but I haven't seen anything to really make me doubt that Michigan State defense. It is really good. And as last weekend tells us, there's nothing like college football. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> that was a great weekend to sit on the couch and have a feeling yeah. this one will be too, and we're thrilled it's right here on Fox Fantastic. 2. All right, Dan. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. The people of Detroit, what do we want? Yes, the weapons of Detroit, what do we want? Yes, the protests and demonstrations could not stop the inevitable. Tonight, Detroit is in bankruptcy. Will the voices of city workers and retirees be heard loud and clear? Or has that door been closed? We let it rip. Next.
care about the people. This to me is, uh, is just a sham. It shows that we don't have any justice in this federal court. Hell no to the bankruptcy! Hell no to the bankruptcy! This is a death sentence for 23,000 retirees if he uh, allows the pensions to be cut. There's going to be pain for a lot of different people. Bankruptcy isn't the problem. Bankruptcy is the solution. Let's come together, let's work together, and let's get this done. Welcome to this special edition of Let It Rip. On the panel tonight, he's known worldwide as an expert in bankruptcy law. He's worked as a litigator for several firms before finding his home as a professor at U of M Law School. By the way, his law degree is from Harvard, the second best law school in the country. <laughs> Professor John Pato is back. The Michigan of the East. There you go. Also with us, an expert in the state's emergency manager law. He's a member of the team that declared Pontiac in financial crisis and brought in an EM. He's here to tell us what we might see in the coming months as bankruptcy plays out. Attorney Tim Whittable is here. And back from spending all day in court, the attorney who never sleeps, Charlie Langton, <laughs> is ready to rule. <laughs> Professor Pato, let's begin with you. History made today. Where do we stand tonight? Yeah, this is a big day. Um, not a great day for the unions. Uh, Detroit's eligible to file. De the city got basically everything it asked for and more. There were a lot of people thinking that Judge Rhodes would not rule on the constitutionality of what happens to the pensions. He had a good cover. If he didn't want to do it, he could kick it down the road, but he didn't. He took the issue and he said, you know what, you want me to decide the constitutionality? Okay, it's constitutional to impair the pensions. That was not expected by a lot of predictors. So I was going to say, a bad day for the unions, I'm afraid. Well, uh, you've been through this, Tim, uh, in Pontiac, and frankly, they're winners and losers. Correct. Are you then pitting the needs of people who rely on those public pensions against city services to decide who wins and who loses? Absolutely. Chapter 9 requires that the municipality provide the necessary governmental services. And that's what Orr has been doing and that's what his goal is. And if you listen carefully to Judge Rhodes' oral opinion, uh, he set it up very nicely. He talked about crime. He talked about uh, uh, the uh, response time being extremely lengthy compared to other cities of similar size. So he set it up so that it was clear that first and foremost, the city of Detroit was going to provide the necessary services to its citizens. And so now you've got 600 citizens who are entitled to those services, and you've got basically 20,000 pensioners. That's what was pitted to get one against the other. Well, Charlie, the judge, you were in court today. You heard the judge make his ruling. You heard him go through it step by step. Did you have the feeling that Judge Rhodes has sympathy for the retirees in the city of Detroit? Absolutely, Judge Rhodes has sympathy for the pensioners. There's no doubt in my mind, he said it a number of times. He said, people, remember the human factor in this whole case. But I do think there was one thing that uh, the pension, uh, pension people ought to, be, uh, ought to take to heart. They refused to negotiate. Early on, they said, we, you cannot touch our pensions. They're sacrosanct. You can't touch them at all. And I don't think, when if you're into a negotiation and the first thing out of your mouth is, you're, we're not budging at all. And then Kevin Orr says, well, here's $2 billion, split them up. And the, and the retiree said, forget it. Take that $2 million and shove it. We're not negotiating. I don't think the judge liked that at all. And I think the judge is encouraging uh, negotiation over litigation. Well, part of the reason that the union said that was because the state constitution says their pensions are protected. Not, not now it doesn't. Not now. Not now. now. Uh, hey, judge maybe. Rhodes. Judge Rhodes did a pretty lengthy analysis, and he said, I look at the Constitution and what it means in the 63 convention when they had it, and he said, I just don't think it's meant to affect the federal bankruptcy power. In bankruptcy, he said, they're contracts. He said, the Constitution says they're contracts. Right. The problem is, that's what bankruptcy is. It's about renegotiating and, 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 and restructuring contracts. And so he said, I, you know, I understand they're important, and he did say that. He said, I, I'm watching you. He said, I feel your pain. He said, but at the end of the day, they're just contracts like anything else, and in bankruptcy, they can be impaired. And the bottom line here is that Detroit is broke. Yeah. The judge went on for a half an hour, maybe longer. I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> and he was saying how much the city has. The city didn't make a hundred million dollar payment to the pensioners. The city is losing $45 million a day on this bad swap casino deal. The city is, the basic city services, police and fire and lights, we've been all, all over that for a long time. The city is broke. It needs to be fixed. And pensioners, everybody's got to negotiate. But Tim, these are promises made to people who have very little money as it is. Some of them going on $10,000, $19,000 a year in pensions. You're going to cut that? Well, they're not, the, the, the legacy costs are not sustainable. They may not have been sustainable when they were agreed to. But I look at it from a different point of view. If I'm a pensioner, 
I actually like the decision by Judge Rhodes because if you listen to his opinion, he basically said that he's going to be paying attention to the plan submitted by Orr, and he's going to be paying particular attention to the treatment of the pensioners, and it better be fair and equitable. So now they've got someone at least on their side to make sure that the decisions are fair and equitable, as, but right now they have nothing. Well, I went to law school and I've got three lawyers right here, but when you mention terms like fair and equitable and reasonable, I know that I can argue anything in court and claim that it's fair. Well, but, but here's one thing. I do, I, I do agree with Tim in one way. It is better today for the pensioners because the judge said that the city did not bargain in good faith. And, that, and, the, and the judge went out of his way to say that. That's one of the rules. Mm -hmm. You have to, the little checklist of what you have to, the criteria you have to meet to be eligible for bankruptcy. One of them, the city is broke, and the other one, the city has to ar bargain in good faith with creditors. But that there were so many creditors, that. though, that it didn't matter. But that's, no. a be that's better, though. It's it, the judge said it was impossible to negotiate with all the creditors. And I think that's for the pensioners. That's better than having the judge said, you know what? We, the city did bargain in good faith, and it didn't work. Yeah, that's he, he called out the city. He was pretty harsh. Yes, he absolutely. said, look, you said you negotiated in good faith. You didn't give them the plans. You said there was some data room. That wasn't really usable. You gave them 30 days, which basically take or leave it. So he called out the city. He said, you did not negotiate in good faith. And then he turned around and said, but you guys, you didn't budge. So it's like you've sort of forfeited your right to good faith, and it's impossible to negotiate with all these people anyways. I think what you're seeing is Rhodes is kind of knocking their heads together because he wants them to sit down and come to the negotiating table. He says, you stop fooling around as the city. You guys stop being and transigent, get together and work this bloody thing out. So does the judge give the city the hammer or is it the judge with the hammer hitting everybody else? <laughs> well, I, I think, well, the judge's is, power is limited. He can't interfere with the provision of city services. He can't interfere with the operation of the municipal government. But what he's saying is, folks, get together because you both need to come together and, and work a little harder to make this you know, make this benefit both sides if you can. But once again, the pensioners today, or prior to the bankruptcy decision, uh, they there was no money there. They weren't getting paid um, because Judge Rose or uh, or was was turning the lights back on and buying well, police cars and leverage, doing. He wants to leverage them. I mean, there's going to be a deal this week where you know you leverage uh, some utility taxes to get about two hundred million dollars to turn the lights on. That's a good deal, but yet there are creditors that are objecting to that. Right. I mean, uh, you know, I don't I quite understand that. Well, they have a but, fiduciary. Yeah. They have a fiduciary obligation to the shareholders. They have to collect as much as but they in can. In bankruptcy court, in this chapter nine, the primary what the judge has to do is make sure that basic city services right. are continuing. Please, right. fire and lights. And the credit to say, yes, we do have assets, including the treasures of the DIA. When we come back, we're going to talk about that mm -hmm. and much more. Still to come on Letter Rip, the bankruptcy judge made it clear that he will make most of the final decisions in this process. So what does that mean for emergency manager Kevin Orr? What will his role be from now on? We'll take a closer look at that and the DIA when Letter Rip returns.
we've been marching our way here for 60 years. That's two generations. It's going to take some time for us to dig ourselves out of this predicament and out of this situation citywide. Emergency Manager Kevin Orr talking about how Detroit got to the brink of Chapter 9 bankruptcy and why tonight we're in a financial mess that will likely take months to fix. And who gets hurt when we do fix it? Welcome back to this special edition of Let It Rip, the focus, Detroit and bankruptcy. With us, U of M Law Professor John Pato and attorneys Tim Witterbort and Charlie Langton. The judge said today there was no promise that would not be examined, no asset that would be left untouched, and he mentioned the DIA. I heard late tonight that Kevin Orr had priced roughly 500 items in that museum at $2 billion. Mm. What That's now? a big deal when you've got a pension liability of $3 billion. If you frame it that way and say, we could sell this stuff up and cover the pension shortfall, it's a tough pill to swallow to the retirees to say, oh, by the way, you've got to take cuts in your pension. And some pension say, uh, saying, look, retirees say, look, sell it. If you sell it, at least I'll get some of my pension that you yeah. promised. They'd rather have the pension dollars than a Rembrandt and the DIA. <laughs> and Seriously. And, and so, but what Orr might try to do is monetize that in a, in a way to generate revenue without really losing the opportunity for people to go visit the DIA. And that's what they're going to work on. But One of the suggestions were that possibly uh, benefactors come in and, and donate money in order to keep the art there and that money be used towards pension. There was talk about foundations asking Correct. the Skillman Foundation, the Kellogg Correct. Foundation, these wealthy foundations, charities, to come in and save Detroit somehow. Uh, the Perkins Foundation. Well, uh, I mean, I'm not that big. Uh, you, there you go. That would look very nice in your living room. Right? That's a beautiful chandelier. I mean, I, actually, I mean, it's, it's funny, but the judge seemed to hint on that today. Yeah. He did actually mention private companies, as you say, to come on in and buy the DIA art or, or not buy it so much, but le leverage it. Again, I'm have an authority on the art, perhaps. I think, though, to sell it, though, the judge did caution, though, to get money, it's bad to sell assets. you got to be careful when you do that and use a caution. It's not the best way to do it because it's a one-time fix. And then where does that money go? If you have, you're have funding pensions, okay, that's good, but pensions are going to continue after. And you, you can't stop, you've got to stop the bleeding somewhere. Right. I mean, all these yeah. workers right now are still getting pensions. There's somehow, current workers will have to convert to a 401k. Actually, they're doing that now. But those workers that are, you pick an age. People have done, Oakland County switched from pensions to 401ks 20 years ago. It can be done. There's a mechanism to do it. 95% right. of the employers in this country have defined uh, compensation plans. They don't have defined benefit plans. U of M has a 403b, like a 401k. Right. Same so I think what you're right, Charlie, but what, what Judge Rhodes said, I think we saw two Steve Rhodes today. We saw the Steve Rhodes who writes a 140 page opinion very meticulous, crosses every T. This guy does not want to get overruled. He wants to have every That's argument right. covered. And then we saw Steve Rhodes at the end, who sort of stepped back a bit, and he said, I've been watching this case. I've been listening to the residents of Detroit, hearing about the streetlights, hearing about the service providing. And he said, and I think something's wrong here. And if these pensions, which I'm now giving you the authority to cut, if these are cut and these people aren't taken care of, he's basically saying that's unconscionable. He said, I, I, I want the social safety net to be protected. And that's very sort of, I think, I, he didn't have to say that. I think he, it really was coming from the heart, from a man who's been watching this for a long time. And I think it was almost like throwing down a political gauntlet to, you know, Lansing and maybe D.C. Well, he did, he did mention DA, but he did not mention the water department. Uh, is that is an asset, a city asset. Correct. What could happen there? Well, once Sold. again, they could they <laughs> could sell it, they could leverage Boarding. it, they could find uh, determine ways to increase the capacity, increase the, the subscribers. That's what Pontiac did. Uh, they were able to leverage their water department because it, it was not uh, being used to its full capacity. So in Pontiac, they they deeded the water department over to an authority and got fifty plus million dollars in that deal, roughly. Just like oh, long term, and, and, and they were able to, the city was able to repay a lot of their debt obligations. Would there be a way for Detroit to retain ownership of its water system and yet still maybe lease it and make money from it? I don't know. Well, it depends how you structure it. But typically, if, if an authority is created, uh, the assets have to be owned by that authority. But that doesn't, that doesn't suggest that at some point in time it can't revert back to the city. So if the judge has the real power in this process, then what is Kevin Orr's role? Well, the judge doesn't have the power no. to do that. He, he, the ju he, can, he can sit back and approve things or disapprove of things, but the, the motivation has to come from the city, and that's, that's Kevin Orr right now. That's Kevin correct. Orr is, is 
calling the oar. <laughs> oh, he, he's, Kevin Orr is the one that's going to have to make this deal go down. What I would have done to the judge, I was a little surprised that he actually ruled on the on the Michigan Constitution yeah. and uh, the fact that it does not Which is already pensions. being appealed, by the way. But that's the same decision they reached in Stockton, the judge in Stockton, California. Reached the same decision. What I would have done is, I were the judge to have that hammer. I would have said, "I'm going to take that under advisement. I'm going to you guys work it out, and in the end, I will make a ruling. But I want you guys to work it out first. But Charlie, that doesn't do that, that doesn't knock their heads together. Right, See, the problem right. is, if they're saying we got 100 percent or nothing, right? If they keep holding on to that belief, they got the right. Well, so that's what I say too. Once you once you start negotiations, someone says, "I'm not negotiating." Those are fighting words. Right. And the judge put an end to that right now. But Orr I said think the judge was really upset. Yeah, the judge is concerned about the human factors, but this judge wants this bankruptcy done. But, but Orr he said that. Or said that too. He said in our meetings, he said, "This is not negotiable." And this the retiree sued Orr. Right. Besides okay. stubbing the nose of two million dollars, besides besides not negotiating, and they sued Orr. And what are you going to do? There's still several ways to work this out. Now he could make sure that current retirees are protected, but then raise the retirement age for people who. Hire it later. There are several ways to work. He doesn't have to treat every individual now on a pension the same way. There are some, a few wealthy retirees who maybe don't need as much money from the city. We're back to fair and equitable, which is if there's a justification for different treatment, like these people have now retired, they have no other income, I see that as a perfectly plausible base of treating them differently Correct. versus younger people who can still adjust versus bondholders who can buy insurance, etc. So there's lots of flexibility. Well, well, there's, there's, well, there's another issue here that uh, people uh, haven't discussed. You may freeze the pension benefits or limit the pension mm -hmm. benefits today, mm -hmm. but if the city is able to turn around and start generating positive revenue, you can, the city can always decide to reinstate those pension yeah, benefits or those health care benefits once the city reaches certain benchmarks. So it's, it's not as if they're oh, gone right. forever. But hopefully this is the road to recovery. But the bottom line, treat those in need, if possible, with the greatest care. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Gentlemen, we thank you for your comments and your insights. Stay with us. Much more to come. After the story we did today, I'm curious. What did you talk to your kids about last night? Their homework, their friends, their futures? How was their day? How was their night? How was theirs? My niece and nephew had to experience a gun being put to their head. I seen them running back in the apartment complex and they were screaming and howling. I leave my will to just give it up so you won't, so we won't, so you won't kill us. And if they would have gave it to him and still would have shot him, I wouldn't have my kids today. <laughs> It ain't about no snitching no more. Of course she's furious about what happened to her family, but she's fed up with all this foolishness that's going on. And she's looking at more than a few folks to fix it. I'm Andrea Isom, and that's tonight on The Edge.